Welcome, everyone. We are here at Beyond Words Presents, your online learning experience. And I am my, I am your host, Jackie Hooper, and I'm so pleased to be here with Ruth Miller, editor of the Library of Hidden Knowledge series. And she is here to share with us today a little bit of the incredible insights missed in the New Thought text, and not only the insights missed, but the value and the impact it has on our life today. So thank you so much for being here, Ruth. Welcome. Thank you. It's a delight to be able to be here. I'm so glad. So you have written seven translations, is that correct? Yeah, I think that's where we're at, yes. So <laughs> you obviously love doing this. And so what, in, what inspired you to get started? Uh, I had already done one or two before Beyond Words contacted me for this series, which is why they contacted me <laughs> for this series. Uh, the original ones that I did were because neither my students or my fellow students, when I was in seminary, were having trouble, were able to understand, neither of them were able to understand what some of those 19th century writers were saying. And I had shared one of those volumes with Cindy here at Beyond Words. And so when The Secret got published and everyone was going gaga over, what are those books? What are those books? She came back to me and she said, would you be willing to translate Wallace Waddle's Science of Getting Rich? And I said, I'd be willing to look at it, and that's what launched the whole process. Wow. Yeah. And so as you were going through each translation, do you have a certain goal in mind that you're trying to accomplish for people, for readers to have, you know, in their lives? Uh, the, the primary goal is that they can comprehend the idea. You know, when people were speaking and writing in the 19th century, they used a very different vocabulary. They used a different syntax and grammar. Their sentences were structured differently than they used to. Um, they were trained to use very long sentences and very complex paragraphs and, and dependent and independent clauses and all those wonderful things that we don't do. <laughs> we <laughs> like simple declarative sentences. We like short paragraphs. We like headings. We like bullets. We like you know, summary points. <laughs> so those are some of the things that we include in our translation. And so you mentioned that you did this, you started to do these because you were in seminary school and people were having trouble understanding. So how has your translations of these texts, how can they help people even not in seminary school, just the average reader, what have you done to make that possible? Thanks. The books are actually originally written for an average reader. They were never intended to be used in seminary. It's just they were what was available, so seminary offered them. <laughs> um, then the average reader has changed, so we're continuing that average reader focus. The Signs of Getting Rich is saying if you're in the workplace now and you feel like there's some part of you that wants to get developed further, here is not only how to do it, here is why it must happen. You can't not have it happen. Mm -hmm. And the same with panels, the master key, which I think is our most popular one. I get emails from all over the world for the master key. Indonesia. I got one from Saudi Arabia the other day. Wow, <laughs> what did that one say? He was saying, on page such and so, you say this at paragraph one and this in paragraph three. Can you explain those two and how they conflict and whether they do? <laughs> Wow, so it sounds like you're really engaging people with these texts. Apparently, and yeah. I'm delighted. Well, and so just to present this other side of things, these texts have been around for years. They yes. are available everywhere. So I'm curious, what exactly do you feel you do to make them unique? There's three things besides the modernization of the text. Mm -hmm. We also use a current set of examples. So it might, you know, where Emerson would have been talking about horse and buggy, we tend not to do things like that. We'll yeah. talk about cars or airplanes. Um, we also integrate modern science. A lot of the concepts that they were introducing then as ideas or understandable truths or logically derivable, you know, concepts. We now have some scientific proof for it. We now have bodies of theory that support. And because my pre-seminary experience was in the system of sciences and environmental studies and anthropology, I was able to pull a lot of that in to this material and be able to say, okay, this is what the current science is on this. This is what the current science is on that. And the final thing that we do is we include exercises. 
most of the books that we have you know, found for this series do not have exercises. And the exercises that we put in are very, very much attuned to today's life and to moving people out of whatever sense of being stuck they might have had. And so being able to do that for people, I imagine it's really impacted you in a positive way. And I'm curious, just on that personal level, what has this done for your life? How has these translations and these opportunities to modernize these texts impacted you? They become my spiritual practice to some extent. <laughs> you know, immersing myself in these ideas, immersing myself in what these people are saying and, and what they are communicating and the stories that they tell and the transformations that happen is a wonderful way to remind myself, oh yes, that's what's true. Oh yes, that's what works. And it, you know, we all forget, no matter how much we use this material, we forget and we get caught up in cultural norms. And so I get to be reminded in a very detailed way on a fairly consistent basis, which is wonderful, a few weeks every year. Yeah. Well, and for those of you watching right now, if you're joining us and you're realizing at the end of the year, reflecting on your life, that you might be stuck in some cultural norms that aren't serving you and you want to kind of get back to the root of things, we have an amazing opportunity for you to purchase all seven translations of Ruth Miller's Library of Hidden Knowledge for $49.95, which Ooh. is over 50% yeah. off the retail value, which is exciting. It's so great to have that opportunity during the holidays. If you're thinking about buying some last-minute gifts for your family and friends, if you're thinking about gifts for yourself and you are approaching the new year and want to start delving into some of these topics, please, please, please visit www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller and take a look at the seven translations that Ruth Miller has done. Thank you. That's a fabulous deal. I may have to tell my friends to take you up on it. It is amazing. <laughs> and so your latest book, which I will hold up here, this is the latest translation, and it's The Spiritual Science of Emma Curtis Hopkins. Tell us a little bit about this. Emma was the teacher of teachers for all the different branches of new thought that became something like a church a study center or um, a place where people would gather on a regular basis. The founders had been students of Emma Curtis Hopkins. So she's really core to a lot of what people experience today. And it was important that we do something of hers. However, almost everything of hers that has been put out there is a transcription of a stream of consciousness lecture. Emma is very difficult to understand. In fact, she under, she knew that. She um, commented to someone that there had been a misunderstanding in a certain situation because, well, they just didn't understand my complicated way of explaining myself. <laughs> she uh, spoke almost as if one were reading the King James Bible, and almost as if one were listening to Shakespeare. It wasn't rhyming couplets, but it was that same complexity of, of phrasing. And she had studied, uh, she taught literature and chemistry and geometry before she started doing this work. And so all of these people from the ancient Greeks through the early Christian mystics and then as she began to do this work, the uh, spiritual literature from other cultures were like her old friends. So she would say, as Carlyle says, or as Emerson says, or as someone you've never heard of says, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew please, you know, or someone, um, she just, you know, would launch into what they said and keep on going. Mm -hmm. And so part of my job is to help people understand who those people were, where that quote came from, <laughs> and how it might possibly be relevant to today's world. There is another piece that we have done in that, and you know, I need to make that clear. Almost all of these people who are writing in the 19th century assumed everyone was a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so almost all of their references were to the King James Bible because that's what there was. And what we've done is assumed everyone is some kind of spiritual path and they might want to know what Lao Tzu had to say or what the Buddha had to say or what the Quran has to say on these different subjects. So we've integrated quotes from virtually every spiritual tradition as, as it is relevant to explain and underline what is being said. 
Now with the spiritual sciences and the Curtis Hopkins, what we did was take something that she had called the esoteric philosophy of spiritual science, which was really the capstone of all of her work. She had done teaching, she had been teaching the 12 lessons for about 20 years at that point. She started teaching in 1986, 1906 is when she closed the school, and between 1906 and 1918 she put together some more books and, and did a lot of work on the road. And then 1906 and uh, 1923 is when she was all, you know, just functioning as an independent scholar, which was wonderful, and healer and teacher. Esoteric philosophy came out as, well, if you've done the basic course, if you've done the advanced course, if you've been out there practicing, this is what you need to know. <laughs> and we're offering it as an introductory text. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So part of what I got to do was go back to her introductory thing, weave those into this advanced text that was saying the great mystics of the world have understood these things, and here is how we can apply it. Lesson one, lesson two, lesson three, all the way through. And each of her lessons has the same basic message, no matter which book you pick up, but they have variations, and this one is, this is what the great mystical teachers have said, and this is how you can apply. Wow. And so there are 12 lessons. Yes. Correct. So is there a certain lesson that someone watching this now might be able to start today? At the most important lesson or the most fundamental lesson that they should have? Guess what? Lesson one. <laughs> <laughs> and for those watching who might not know, what is lesson one? Lesson one is the foundation. It's the statement of what the fundamental truth of everything is. And it completely reverses what most people learned in most spiritual teaching. The exoteric, the outer teaching, is a cultural orientation and is usually based on control and shoulds and ought. The esoteric, the inner teaching, the mystic teachings in all the spiritual traditions, have really very little connection with the, um, with the cultural norm, but they have a lot of connection with what is true at the highest level of being. So she begins to wake people up to that understanding the most important. And as she says, every lesson includes all the lessons. Mm -hmm. You never get just one lesson. And I don't have to do something with your head here. <laughs> And so, within that first lesson, is there a certain tip or activity someone could start doing to start to explore those ideas? Wonderful. The fundamental practice of lesson one is to repeat lesson one over and over again until it's the only thing you're thinking. <laughs> but more than that, what she's doing in lesson one is she's encouraging us to understand that what we have called God, what we've called good, is omnipotent omnipresent and omniscient. And omnipresent means it is everywhere present. So the fundamental practice of lesson one is to name what we think is good and to see it wherever possible. Hmm. I love that. I love recognizing the good, especially now in the holiday season when we are with family and friends and trying to be grateful for things. This is a great practice to start doing now. Absolutely. So what she would love to see everyone do every day is make a list of what they think is good and to see it everywhere they can. Wow. I encourage everyone watching right now to do just that. Like I said, during the holiday season, make a list of what's good. It's simple. It's fun. It's, it's really valuable, I think. And start the conversation and, and then pick up this book and go to lesson two. <laughs> <laughs> so there's... The, there's another book in this series you mentioned, and it was it was um, the New Science of Getting Rich. Mm -hmm. And I thought this one was an interesting one, especially you know with the economy the way that it is now. People are really trying to figure out what to do, where to go, um, and so what lessons or valuable points in that book would you like to share? You know, the New Science of Getting Rich is a wonderful book. There, it, it's kind of the basis for the other branch of New Thought. One branch of New Thought moved toward the church and spiritual and healing and transformation of the inner experience leading to the 
transformation of relationships and everything. The other branch went into the business world. And Wallace Waddles was in the business world. Napoleon Hill, all of his work fits into that world. Um, Clement Stone, all those people. So what Wallace Waddles was attempting to help us understand was very similar, actually, in the beginning to what Emma had to say. And that is, he's saying, the universe is designed to facilitate every being to achieve their fullest potential. Mm -hmm. And so all we have to do is give up thinking and acting in the ways that prevent us from achieving our fullest potential. And he points out that in a culture that's based on exchange of money, if you want to do the things to experience what you need to experience, to learn what you need to learn, you need to learn how to acquire money. And so he builds into the system both the awareness, I get to be who I really am, who I've always dreamt I could be, and here's how to get the resources to make that happen. Hmm. So that's a huge, huge question. How can I become who I want to be and should be? What are some of the day-to-day the -day tips that people can do now through that? Well, what Wallace suggests, first of all, is that we pay attention to what we're thinking. Hmm. New thought. Hmm. The fundamental thing about new thought is, yeah, you know, if you want to live a new way, you have to give up your old thought and replace it with a new one, right? Uh -huh. And what he's offering us to do is to be, to be first aware of our thoughts. He's requesting that we do that. And also to begin to see the possibility that, for example, there are unlimited resources in the universe. We're accustomed to saying that we're, we only have what's in our pocket or what's in our checking account. And he's saying, wait a minute, take a larger look here, <laughs> you know? There's mm -hmm. an unlimited, an infinite supply in this universe. How can we begin to experience that? So as he, you know, in the very beginning part, he's saying, look at what's real and realize that all the limitations you experience are your old way of thinking. And start seeing how everything is unlimited. An acorn doesn't become a tree, it becomes a forest, mm. right? The amount of gold available to humanity is not the amount that's buried in some fort somewhere, <laughs> right? Uh, and, you know, it's even beyond what's even on this planet, etc. So, manifesting resources, he says, I love this line, this is um, early on in the page 33 in the thing. You're here to create your riches from the formless substance that permeates your environment. Isn't that beautiful? That is. Yeah. It's everywhere present. Yes. To continue that theme. <laughs> and I'm curious, does he talk about giving? Absolutely, because when we give, then we know we have more than enough. Hmm. When we hoard, it's because we're afraid we don't have enough. So the more we can give, the more we experience having more than enough which means we're opening the way to have more than enough. In fact, in my own life, the first thing I do when I start to feel lack is start giving things away. Yeah, I love that. It and works. So, yeah, it sounds like it, and that could be a great, you know, I'm, I'm wondering what advice you might have during the holidays when we think we're just, you know, some of us get worried about how much we have to spend, and, um, you know, some people really enjoy giving, some people struggle with it. What advice do you have for people to remind them just what you said that giving actually gives to the person and to yourself? Mm -hmm. I think starting with what's in the heart rather than what the culture is trying to tell us to do. Mm -hmm. So if I feel a heart connection with the person, then the thing to give them becomes very clear and very obvious. And the resources to do so are immediately available. Hmm. Great. And I do have a viewer question. Oh, wow. Yes. Um, a viewer would like to know, out of all of the people that you've translated, who is your favorite author to translate? Oh, my goodness. You know, they're, they're each absolutely unique. I mean, you get into Emerson, and he has these incredible gems of poetry buried in three-page long paragraphs, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, you know, to, to mine the gems is great fun. With Emma, of course, everything she has to say is so powerful. She, she encapsulates 
everything we would ever need to know to become the most powerful being we could be. When we were working with James Allen, uh, Henry Covey and I were working on that one together, he's the one who did As a Man Thinketh, and he created As We Think So We Are with that. Uh, his use of his own poetry and his integration of Buddhist ideas with Christian ideas was so seamlessly wonderful. You know, I, I'm sorry, I can't give you a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay. It sounds like all of them, and that's important, that all of them have some part of you that is important to share with people, and I, I think that's great. Thank you. Yeah, going back to what you were saying about Emma, with the little gems that you see in her work that you kind of have to dig through to find, did you have any challenges making sure that, that you wanted to represent all the parts correctly right. and, and in a way that people could understand? Tell me about that process of trying to make it applicable to the, the average person today. So actually that was with Emerson, uh, with oh, Emerson. Of Emerson's work, and that's fine. Um, I was really hesitant to use to work with Emerson's thing. I mean, he's the great American philosopher, right? Oh my goodness, who am I? You know, to mm -hmm. take on Emerson's material. And so to not in any way take away from what he had to offer and yet make it possible for us to gather what it was he was really trying to say was a huge challenge. And there were there were places where what he was trying to say, he deliberately buried it, and I realized later, yeah, if he'd said those out loud, he would have been tarred and feathered instead of honored. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, you know, in the 1830s and 40s, he was saying racism is not okay, sexism is not okay, um, he was saying we should not pay attention to what the culture tells us to do, we should only live from the inside out. He was saying everybody has direct access to what he called the oversoul and what everyone around him called God. Um, you know, so he was really pushing the envelope, and he did bury a lot of that in some pretty heavy prose. But then there would be these incredible visuals that he would provide in long, complex sentences, and if I could just grasp the visual, then it might work. And I do have a favorite place that I like to do that. Uh, it's really in the very first chapter. Um, natu in, in Natural Abundance is the book. And this essay is on nature's riches, reality, beauty, and law. And my version of what he says is, Every, everywhere there are days when the world reaches its perfection. It may happen in any season of the year when the air, yeah. the sun, and clouds, and the earth form a wonderful harmony. Everything that has life seems satisfied. Even the cattle resting on the ground seem to have peaceful thoughts, and solitary places don't seem lonely. On such a day, at the edge of the forest, we remember ancient tales of forest magic, and the silent trees invite us to come live with them and leave our life of self-important trifles. On such a day, we could walk into the opening landscape and let each new vista, each new discovery fill our mind until all memory of home and work is crowded out by the fullness of the present moment. Wow. So he said those things across three pages. <laughs> <laughs> but I, he was able to say it so clearly that it made it possible for me to pull it together. Wow. I can't imagine it being a difficult thing to to try and shorten, like you were saying at the beginning, we want quick bits of information, we want the bullet points, we want the headers. And did you feel that you were still being true to the text by doing those things? I did my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I say, what we did at each one is we came up with essential points at the end. So we not only shortened the original text, but we then we tried to capture the essence in the bullet. And I have had students of the Emma Curtis Hopkins material, the spiritual science material, come back and say, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Those essential points, they make it possible to you know, grasp the idea when otherwise they were still getting lost in the you know, concentrated information that she offered. <laughs> 
Yeah, and that seems to really be the point, I feel, is to, to help people who are studying this who might not have learned about it and to help them understand that the, the point is to make the ideas clearer so that they can use the ideas and right move on. forward. Right on. Thank you. Yeah. If you're just joining us, I am talking to Ruth Miller, editor of the Library of Hidden Knowledge series, and she's talking about all of the amazing translations that she's done for various New Thought texts. And if you are loving what she's saying, enjoying what we're talking about, and wanting to get more of the details on how to utilize these practices in your life, you can go to www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller to learn more about the bundle for $49.95, which again is amazing. Yes. <laughs> so tell me about another translation that's interesting to you. Well, look, actually, I was just looking at the one law book. Uh huh. So I'll put that in the camera next. Um, which I think this was the hardest one. Why do you say and that? Well, it's really fundamental to particularly Ernest Holmes thinking because he grew up with this book. And it came out at a time when people were trying to reconcile what Darwin was saying with what the church had been telling them their whole life. And he, this is a very evangelical Christian reconciling Darwin's theory. <laughs> <laughs> so to be able to do that in our interfaith approach, um, to take a book that was actually many times longer than we can do in our series and find some key essays in it, uh, to take his uh, 1850s science and bring it up to modern science and you know all of those bits and pieces it was not easy. <laughs> yeah. But the fundamental concept that he had to offer was so powerful. What he was trying to say is that you can't look at any one part of the universe and assume that it operates on different laws from any other part. And you can't look at the physical universe and assume that it operates on different laws from the spiritual. And so then, if that's the case, how do we move forward? Now, on the weekdays, this guy was a natural history professor. He would move in, you know, students from you know, believing in the five days of, or seven days of creation to believing in the evolution of all kinds of fossils and so on. And, and he would do physics experiments and all kinds of things in his classroom. And then on the weekend, he would go into uh, the poorer parts of Edinburgh and hang out with the working men there and evangelize. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Sundays, you know, some Sundays, he would go into the medical school and provide training, missionary training, for uh, Scott's medical students who were planning to go into the field. So what apparently happened is that he began to hear himself saying the same kinds of things in both environments. And that surprised him. He was not expecting it. He thought he had to hold the two as separate. You know, he wanted, you know, you thought science over here, spirit over here, right? Mm -hmm. I get in trouble for it all the time because in my world they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I needed to get this book done. <laughs> <laughs> you can't separate it. And what he came to understand was that the spiritual life could be understood in the same way as the vegetable life, the, min the plants reaching down into the soil transforming inert minerals into living cells. Okay, so the roots reach down, they grab inert minerals, they bring them into the plant and through a very clear process that we have no idea how it works, uh, they take these inert minerals and they turn them into cells, living tissue. And he's saying the same thing is happening between the spiritual and the human that the spiritual world is reaching down into mm -hmm. us and bringing, it, bringing us into the spiritual beings that we are becoming. I love that. Yeah, it's really wonderful. As you were talking, we had another viewer question. Okay. This is from Harry, and he asks, do you ever think that the world will be perfect as most people say that nothing slash no one is perfect? Ah, uh, yes. 
the material world is always going to be experienced through the mental limitations that we have, our own mental framework. It's like, you know, we each have a mental framework and all we can see is that. We, mm -hmm. you know, and until we change the framework, we can't see anything else, right? So whatever the world is, is going to be my mental framework. So until my mental framework is perfect, <laughs> I can't see that perfection. And what you know, Drummond would have said is that perfection is only possible when we become fully spiritual beings. Uh, what Emma would say is by the time you are actually living her 12th lesson, you know yourself to be a transcendent being in a transcendent universe. And there are no limitations of any kind. And that would be the closest we can come to perfection. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for asking your question. And thank you for answering it, Ruth. So My pleasure. when you are we're, we're having these all these new thought people that you're translating, why is it important? Why should we learn about these thoughts and these people? Marvelous. Well, you actually said it, you know, when you were first introducing the first set, uh, the cultural norms that no longer serve us. <laughs> <laughs> we all find that we are caught in programs and ways of thinking, in assumptions, in mental frameworks that are causing aging, illness, sense of lack of separation, wars, you know, all those things. So if we don't want to experience those things, we need a different mental framework, different set of thoughts. So that's why it's important. What do you think has happened to our society and our world and our culture to where these thoughts have kind of gotten lost, that we need to approach them again and, and see them in our lives now? What happened? Actually, I think they're more present in our culture today than they have ever been in the empire culture that is now beginning to end. Um, empire culture is about 6,000 years old. Humanity has been on the planet for a lot longer than that. And I've written other books on this subject in other worlds, <laughs> other, <laughs> other dimensions of my life. But if we think about, say, the way a Northwest Coast uh, indigenous person in the U.S., might, you know, North America, might have experienced the world, it's very much in alignment with these ideas or the way a, um, someone in the Amazon today, who's not having to deal with their forest being destroyed yet, um, they would be living very much with these ideas. Shaman shamanic teachings and the fundamental core spiritual truths are almost always these fundamental ideas. But the, it's the nature of the empire culture to impose other ideas. It's the nature of it to say, you are not worthy, only a few people are worthy. It's the nature of it to say, you don't get to have that, only a few people get to have that. You know, so these other ideas get introduced. What happened in the 19th century was a lot of other spiritual paths became available to people. The Buddhist writings, the Hindu writings, the Taoist writings, the Zoroastrian writings, the Zendavesta, were being translated from their original languages into German and then into English. And those then were available and people started waking up. So New Thought is fundamentally an American experience and to some extent a British experience. Our next book is Thomas Troward, an amazing judge, from a uh, British judge who lived in India almost all of his life. Fabulous stuff. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I love how excited you get. Oh, I, you know, everyone I'm doing in the middle, I'm like, oh, this is the best. <laughs> this is really good stuff. Oh, I can hardly wait. <laughs> anyway, so it's almost entirely American because in the early 19th century, the mid to late 19th century, we were the only place on the planet where you could think what you thought and say what you thought. And so when people were beginning to get these new ideas, they could actually teach them. They could go out and speak to groups of hundreds and thousands and you know, get away with it. So New Thought as a movement was born in this country 
and has been, I think, increasing exponentially uh, for a very long time. It's just been buried in a lot of different places. For example, the writings of Emmett Fox, The Sermon on the Mount and Guidelines for Living. Um, Emmett Fox is a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins and Thomas Troward, that British guy I just mentioned, who was ordained by Nona Brooks, who was also a student of Emma Curtis Hopkins and one of her students, Mrs. Bingham. So we've got this linkage. Well, his writings are fundamental to the AA movement. And there's no accident that there's 12 steps in Hopkins' teaching and 12 steps in the AA movement. There's a lot of linkages there. Wow. Well, if you want to learn more about what Ruth is, is discussing, figure out how to apply these principles in your life, and especially during the holiday season and as you approach the new year. I know for me, I'm always interested in reflecting on what I'm going through, and as I approach the new year, add something important, add something new, try something else, and always continue to improve myself. If you feel the same way, um, we have seven translations that Ruth Miller has done on all sorts of New Thought translations, making it applicable to your life with easy steps, practices, exercises, bullet points. And you can get all seven translations for $49.95 at www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller. And so you should grab one today, especially for the Christmas season and the holiday <laughs> season. That's lovely. <laughs> you know, when you mentioned that this is a good time to reflect, mm -hmm. and one is almost one of the consistent points across the book is that we put in 28, 29 day processes because it turns out that that's what it takes to retrain the neural network, the mental framework in the brain. So what we have done is given people opportunities to look back at ideas and possibilities and wishes and dreams and goals and also opportunities to replace ideas that don't work for them. Hmm. So there are several exercises that are perfect for that kind of reflection and in almost every book. What are some of the most exciting exercises that you've done that you think are the most impactful for you personally that you've enjoyed working through? I think the most powerful one is to spend 28 days, at least 10 and preferably 20 minutes a day, describing in as much detail as possible, imagining and feeling in as much detail as possible, life as heavenly as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. I, it just it lifts people out of a whole lot of garbage. <laughs> And it sets up all kinds of possibilities for what some people call the law of attraction to work. You've begun to feel and shift your vibration to be in alignment with that ideal that you have longed for and never be as possible. And so when you when you do that twenty eight day process and you list all of these heavenly how you see your life and how great it would be, what comes next? What do you tell readers to do after that point? Is it just natural and you it just happens and you feel great, or is there something else that they can do after that? <laughs> well, what inevitably starts to come up is all the ways in which life is not like that. <laughs> and that's <laughs> lesson two in Emma. It inevitably comes up that way. So we have a, several different processes, and, and they're outlined in different books depending on the nature of the book, um, that help people to eliminate the thoughts that do not serve them. And they come down to some pretty intense experiences of going back into the times when people got those ideas handed to them or accepted them. Or they may be as simple as every time I imagine, say, perfect health and the little thoughts come up, oh yeah, really, da 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 da, -da. this could be happening and didn't you know about this and you don't, you have this problem, you know, all that stuff. You write all that down, you cross it off, and you write across the top of your page. I am perfect health. And then all the stuff that comes up, you write it up, you write it down, you cross it off. You know, so when the stuff starts to come up, what you're going to do is basically negate it. Undo those negative thoughts that are programs, are training that no longer do. I love that. Undo your thoughts. And do yeah. do each translation have those kinds of kinds of exercises in them? 
Yep, every single one. Wow, that's great. So you, you were talking about the second step in Emma's process. Could you talk a, a little bit more about some of the other steps? Sure. The, it's a very simple setup. The first six lessons are applied to us. The second six lessons are applying the same ideas to the world. So in the first six lessons, first we recognize the true nature of the universe. Second, we throw away the ideas that don't serve us anymore. Third, we claim the new ideas that begin to come into our awareness. We realize, for example, that if the good is omnipresent, lesson one, that means evil can't be present, lesson two. That means only good can be my experience, lesson three. For example, there's several more, but that's one way that flows. Then come lesson four, the world says, are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure you believe that? And so we hold on to it. She calls it faith, and she calls faith like a gallant ship plowing through stormy seas. <laughs> so lesson four is holding on to these new ideas, even when the universe is saying, hey, are you sure? The world around us is reflecting our old ideas. So the more we hold on to the new ones, the more they begin to dissolve. We go back to lesson two, we dissolve them more and more and more. So the sea begins to get calm. In lesson five, we begin to get the, re the works. We see the results of holding on to our faith. So if someone is dealing with a health issue and it just has come up over and over again, it's so intense and they can hardly believe it, but they've hung on to that idea, I am perfect health, all is health, I, you know, whatever, however they're framing it for them. So then in lesson five, they start seeing the results. And in lesson six, they start experiencing not only the peace of those, you know, having gone through this whole process, they start to understand what it is that just happened. And then in the seven through 12, we apply that same set of concepts to the world around us. So I have a little bit of a bigger question, I think. But you were talking about earlier in that, you said that. If there's, if you believe that there's only good, then there's no evil. Yeah. What do you say to people who have experienced a lot of evil, who just have had a tough time at, with things and suffer personally from things, have gone through horrible experiences? What do you say to people who have have been through that, and then you're saying to to not believe that? Right. So. There's three ways to go. One is, I've had some pretty awful things happen in my life, so I can say, been there, done that. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is to recognize what we're saying is that those things that we have called evil have no power. Right? The good is the only power. Mm -hmm. so when something begins to show up and it seems like it's running my life, it's making me a victim, wait a minute, no, 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 no. It has no power. If I can know that, then it just dissolves. It's like the witch in the Wizard of Oz, you know, she melts like lemon drops. <laughs> <laughs> and the third piece is how many times, how many times have people had a terrible thing happen? And 5, 10, 15 years later, they go, you know, that really was the best thing that could have happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. I the love good. that. Yeah, the good is what is. Yeah, and I love the, the point you made about the power piece. I think that's huge, and I think that's what a lot of people miss, is that, yes, evil might exist for you, or you might experience something, but it doesn't have the power over you, yeah. the way that good has the power. Right. That's great. And if you want to learn more about these, these, uh, I'm sorry. If you want to learn more about the power of good and how you can believe the power of good in your life, it will be in the spiritual science of Emma Hopkins, Emma Curtis Hopkins, and you can buy that book as part of the bundle that we're offering now. Forty nine ninety five for all seven translations. Go to the website www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller to find out more. Thank you. Yeah. And so, what piece of advice would you have for people right now 
who might not know anything about these ideas, who can feel really overwhelmed by maybe what they already do know of the text. How can you invite people who might only show up to church on Christmas, or you see them the one time and you've got your one shot? What do you say? If they're asking me for a resource, I'll probably give them the new game of life and say, try this. If you think it's not possible to turn your world around, take a look at these people's lives and this woman who was able to teach these things. If they're just showing up and going, the world is whatever for letter, letter work you <laughs> Um, and I have, you know, and they're saying they have no way to get out of that. Um, I would usually say, can you remember any time in your life when you were totally satisfied, totally excited, totally in love with your life? If you can, you have the possibility of experiencing that for the rest of your life. Yeah. And a lot of what we do with these books is invite people to do exactly that. I am curious if you want to talk a little bit more about why you would give the Game of Life to right. people. What about that book over the others? The others, they're all very useful. And if, if I've got someone who's in the business world, I'll hand them the master key system right the way. If I've got someone who's feeling financially challenged, um, but doesn't want to get into the spiritual thing, I'll hand them the signs of getting rich. But if I have someone who is even the slightest bit interested in discovering that the world doesn't work the way we were taught it works, I, then I give them the game of life. You know, the opening lines are, we were taught that, you know, life is a battle, but it's not. It's a game. And there are rules to the game. And it's just like a video game. Just like any other computer game out there. You take, you know, you, you, you experiment, you try a little of this, you go here and there, and you go, oh, here's a clue. I'll take this clue, and I'll put it on this resource, and I'll apply it over here. And the completion of the game is to accomplish health, wealth, loving relationships, yes, and spiritual, perfect self-expression in every aspect of life. Not just the spiritual, but every aspect of life. Which is, you know, that's where Wallace Waddles was going too. So the new game of life moves people from a place of, I have no power, to being totally empowered with all the tools. And the rules are simple, and they're found in all the spiritual texts of the world. What are just maybe one or two rules that you can give us? <laughs> well, um, one of them is, is that the universe around us will show us just exactly what we're ready to experience. Um, the way Shin talks about that is to help us, or, or to remind us to always be ready. She has a great story about a woman who was trying to move into New York City at a time when there was a housing shortage, nothing available, nothing available, and everyone told her no, there would never be a place available. But she needed to move into the city. And uh, the way Florence tells the story, and by the way, Florence lived in New York City between 1890-something and 1941. So she watched it go from you know, virtually nothing to skyscrapers and taxi cabs and subways. So the way Florence tells the story is the woman was going about her business and she had the opportunity to acquire some furnishings for this apartment she didn't have. And they were the perfect things. She knew they were the perfect things. And common sense would say, are you kidding? You don't even have a place to buy <laughs> to put them. And she went ahead and bought them. And it was you know, to act in alignment with the understanding and the knowing that this is what I'm going to be experiencing. And of course, in a world where apartments were totally unavailable, the apartments were available. 
the another thing that she said was always go with that hunch, that intuition, that inspiration, because inevitably that is leading you in the direction of your dream. Mm -hmm. That's great. Always follow that intuition, that little voice inside of you. It means something. It's there for a reason. Yep. And it may take you in a place that you don't recognize and you're uncomfortable with, but in that spot you'll see something that you could never have seen from where you were before. Hmm. Or it may take you directly where you want to go. Yeah, you never know. Mm -hmm. That's the game of life. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so you had mentioned a few times throughout this chat with you that people have told you various things. The seminary students have said thank you so much for putting this together. It's been so helpful. What other kind of feedback have you gotten from people after reading your, your translations? Mostly that. Uh -huh. um, occasionally people will come up and, well, I work with a woman in uh, Grants Pass who is in her, well, she's going to be 90, I think, and she picked up one law and she just could not put that book down. It was putting everything together for her made everything that made no sense to her prior to this make sense. And that was just so gratifying to, mm -hmm. to have that happen. Um, a lot of what I do in my day-to-day -day work and in these books is to take this piece over here and that piece over here and that piece over there and that piece over here mm -hmm. and make the relationships clear so that we end up with a comprehensive picture that makes sense to us. And that's always a real pleasure when people tell me they got that. That's great to hear. And if if you watching right now want to see how Ruth has put together all of these different pieces for each of these translations to help you in your life, please visit www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller to find out how you can buy all seven translations for $49.95, which is an amazing deal. I'm so excited. I'm very interested in learning more about these. So thank you so much for helping us understand a little bit more about these texts that we might not be familiar with. My and I, pleasure. <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any last thoughts, interesting pieces of information you'd like to share with people watching today. The one summary thought is you know, that if there are aspects of your life that you're not enjoying, if you're not appreciating, there are some sets of ideas or beliefs or memories that have led those aspects of your life to become your experience. And if you want to change them, you need to let go of the old ones and start thinking in a new way. I love that. And just again, for your own personal experience, in what ways has this helped you become a better person? I know we addressed it a little bit at the beginning, but really listening to you talk about this, I imagine some giant changes were probably <laughs> made internally. How could they not when you are entrenched with these amazing philosophies and ideas and learning how to make them applicable to people's lives. What different things have you put in place for yourself that have, have really benefited you? You know, as I say, I was trained in the sciences. I've always been intrigued by and studied as much as I could about consciousness and the nature of spirituality and religious traditions from all over the world. And there was a time in my life where the body just totally gave out. It was during that time that I discovered these principles and these ideas. And it was using these ideas that allowed me to heal the body completely after a six-month prognosis and um, restore full function in every aspect of my life. And it's been teaching me for the last 20 years that has just continued to energize and, and provide incredible experiences. In wow. That's amazing, that personal testimonial of how this has helped. It's incredible. I want to again engage the audience. If you feel lost, if you feel um, like you need 
better health, if you want happiness, if you want to see the good in life, please pick up this package of Ruth Miller's translations. It's incredible. It's been so exciting and beneficial to talk to you, Ruth, today. I'm so thankful for you taking the time to share with everybody a little bit about the work that you do and how necessary it is for our lives today. Thank you. Thank you for saying those kind words. Yes, and so again, one last time, www.beyondword.com forward slash Miller to pick up seven of the translated versions of these texts that Ruth Miller has published for the Library of Hidden Knowledge, $49.95, 50%, over 50% 50 off of, of these books for holiday purchases for the new year. Let's all better ourselves and adapt these ideas into our lives. As far as Beyond Words presents, next week, as a Christmas gift to you all, we will be showing a free screening of Spiritual Liber Liberation, and it's an intimate walk with the founder and director of Agape International Spiritual Center, and we get to witness how he lives his own teachings. So Easy. thank you. Yeah, it'll be exciting to see. I'm excited for that. So thank you so much again, Ruth, for being here. Thank you all for watching, and have a happy holiday, happy new year from Beyond Words Presents.